Hey guys, hope everybody's doing well. Um, we're just about to begin hypothesis testing for multiple populations. Um, and you'll see that the uh, the intuition here is not so different from stuff we've worked before. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's dive right in. I like blue. It's my favorite color. So that's what we're going to start with. Let me drop this. Um, so what we're talking about now is we're talking about hypothesis testing. It's going to take me a little while for my writing hand to get back into the swing of things. But hypothesis testing for multiple populations. Okay. Now this isn't so different from hypothesis testing we've done before, um, which hopefully you're starting to get a little bit more comfortable with. The more we do this, I think the more comfortable it gets, um, which means that we're essentially going to be doing the same five steps. Remember, the first one is we're going to formulate our hypotheses. This is just a very it's a practice of being very precise in what our maintained belief is going to be. Um, right, we have a null, and then we have an alternative, which is what we will uh, reject the null in favor of. So this is maintained belief, and the alternative is what we can prove true um, if we reject the maintained belief. Um, once we state our hypotheses, then we're going to be intellectually honest about what how strong our maintained belief is so alpha is our level of significance we choose it at step two right we choose alpha which is our level of significance essentially this says okay anything that's rarer than alpha alpha is like a percentage right and if the probability of something happening is less than alpha then that leads us to reject our null and so that's what we do that in that case we would reject our null all right step three well then we choose a test statistic and that's going to be different this time as well. Um, but a test statistic is just the characteristic of the population that has a nice distribution. And you can go back and watch the, the original hypothesis testing videos if you want to see these elaborated in more depth. Um, I'm going to kind of go through them a little quickly, and then we'll move on to how we use them in this particular scenario. Um, usually, the test statistic is going to be something that has a Z distribution, which is standard normal, or a T distribution. Later, we'll get into chi-squared or F distributions. Um, but it's going to be some some characteristics. that when we, when we draw a sample, we're choosing some characteristic, a test statistic at random, from one of these from one of these uh, distributions, because we can look them up then. Step four is to collect the data. Um, which in this class, we're, it's not really a class on data collection, so we're just assuming that that's done. Usually the question gives us the data. So we collect the data and then we compute the value of the test statistic, um, which is to say that we look at the world, right, and we actually see what value of these it gives us, right? And then step five, we evaluate the test statistic. And we basically say, okay, so I had a maintained belief, that was my null hypothesis, and then I said, if if I look at the world and there's less than a 1% chance that the, what I see out there is consistent with this null hypothesis, this maintained belief, then I'm going to reject that maintained belief. When we look at the world, what we do then is we take a sample and we use that to compute a Z statistic or a t st some kind of test statistic, a T statistic, chi-squared statistic. And we say, how strange a statistic is that? What's the percent chance I would get a Z that looks like this? Um, and that's our p-value, and then we compare that to our level of significance up here to decide what to conclude. So we make inference based on the value of our test statistic. Okay, so these five steps are going to be the same, regardless of the type of hypothesis test we're doing. Uh, the things that are going to change primarily, this step right here, formulate our hypotheses, um, and sort of these three, but choosing a test statistic is the big one, right? And then that changes a little bit about how we evaluate it because we're looking at a particular distribution. Um, but that, we're using different types of hypotheses, um, different, you know, which is we're just talking about different things. So we have different hypotheses and we have different test statistics. Um, and those are the big differences. Okay, now we're going to start again, just like we did with one sample, uh, with the simplest possible case. The simplest possible case is the case where uh, we don't know. Uh, oh, okay. What we're going to look at first. Let me just back up. I'll cross this out for a second. Before we had one population. Now we have two populations. And what we're going to be looking at now is we're going to be looking at the difference in population means 
this is really common. This is a really common question, right? Um, it's the kind of question like, well, are people in Waukegan, Illinois, on average, is the average person there taller than the average person in, I don't know, Sicily, Italy, right? That's a difference in population means, right? Or uh, do people who have uh, English degrees do better financially than people who have uh, anthropology degrees, right? We're looking at difference in population means. Um, and what we're going to assume, and we, you know, we're going to call these mu1 and mu2, we have two population means, um, because what we have is we have some x, which is some characteristic, like income or height, or filling weight, something like that, some characteristic X, blood pressure. And we have two populations, right? We have one and two. And this is the population mean, mu1 and mu2. Then there's also a population standard deviation, sigma1 and sigma2, that each population has. And what we're assuming for now, just because we're looking at the simplest case, is that we know these things, these two right here. So we're admitting right from the get-go, we don't know these, right? Huh, what's this? I don't know. We don't know these, but we do know these, right? We know this. That's what we're assuming. Um, we'll simplify that, but but that's the way that we're gonna we're gonna do this. So what we do is we use subscripts to index the population, so that we can talk so that we can use the same Greek letters for each one. So we use subscripts to index populations. And that's what these are right here, right? So, so population one is characterized by mu one and sigma one. Population two is characterized by mu two and sigma two. And just like before, what we really care about is we care about real populations, right? We care about how the world really works. Um, so, what the populations look like. We don't know what they look like, um, but we're going to assume we know part of it. We're going to assume we know the shape of these two distributions. Well, it turns out that, um, well, we'll get there. Okay, so we have these for our populations. What we're going to do, again, since we don't know this stuff, what we care about is mu1 minus mu2. That's the difference. Um, you could reverse it if you want, but mu1 minus mu2, it's, you know, we're, we care about the size of that difference, really. Um, so that's, we're going to test hypotheses about this. So we're going to have a hypothesis that this is something, right? Either it's equal to something or greater than something, but there's something about it. Um, we can't know, so what we're going to do is we're going to draw two samples. So population 1 is going to give us sample 1. And sample 1 is characterized by x bar 1, sigma x bar 1, uh, mu x bar 1, and n1 for now. So we have our sample mean, we have the sampling distribution of the sample mean, and then we have the sample size. Sample 2, similarly, is going to be indexed just like this. We're just laying out the groundwork here, trying to give ourselves a vocabulary within which we can talk about the problem. And you can see that for each sample, we, you know, we're, we're drawing from a different distribution, essentially. We're saying we don't necessarily, these could be different. But we're saying, well, x bar 1 might come from something that looks like this, right? or mu x bar mu x bar 1 equals mu 1. And we have a standard deviation of x bar 1, which is just like before, sigma x 1, or sigma 1, over the square root of n 1. Right? And we have another one over here for x bar 2, which might be shaped differently. You get the idea. All the sampling distribution stuff we've looked at before works. So where do we go from here? Hold on, I'm going to need more space here. Well, where we go from here is we know some stuff. What do we know? Well, we know we can get a best guess for what this difference is, right? So let's get that up here. We care about mu1 minus mu2. And our best guess is going to be x bar 1 minus x bar 2. Well, it turns out that, uh, well, th this is random variable, right? We're going to draw some samples. We're going to draw this sample here, we're going to draw this sample here, and because those are random samples, this whole thing is going to be random. Uh, we also know, right, we know that x bar 1 is distributed normally, has a mean of mu 1 and a standard deviation of sigma sigma 1 over the square root of n1, right, that's just what that picture I drew was, 
mu1 and sigma x bar 1, right? We also know that x bar 2 is distributed normally, has a mean of mu2 and a standard deviation of sigma2 over the square root of n2. That's just our sampling stuff. It turns out that if you subtract two normal variables, you get a new normal variable. So if we take x bar 1 minus x bar 2, this itself is distributed normally, just like that. And it's distributed normally like this. The mean is mu1 minus mu2. And the standard deviation here, well, it's a little bit different, but we can draw it. It's going to be the square root of sigma1 squared over n1 plus sigma2 squared over n2. And that's the standard deviation. OK, what that means is that we can draw this as a picture, just like we've been doing the whole time. And so ultimately what we're doing is we're taking a problem that's kind of new and we're transforming it into a problem that's not so new. We want to say something about mu1 and mu2. So what we can do is we can draw a new distribution. Looks like this. That is for any given set of samples we draw of size n1 and n2. It's the distribution of x bar 1 minus x bar 2. And the center is going to be at mu1 minus mu2. And the shape parameter or actually, I guess technically it's a scale parameter, but it, the standard deviation of this, of x bar 1 minus x bar 2, is equal to the square root of sigma 1 squared over n1 plus sigma 2 squared over n2. Okay. What that means is that when we draw a sample, right, we actually pick one from this distribution. Uh, say it's over here. That this is our actual value of x bar 1 minus x bar 2. That we can just use what we've been using, right? We can relate this to the standard normal where this is supposed to be the mean that goes here, zero, sigma equals one. Go down here and we have z. And we can just use a modified version of our score function to get that, right? Because z is equal to x minus mu x over sigma x, where x is any normally distributed random variable, right? Which means now x is x bar one minus x bar two minus mu1 minus mu2 over uh, the square root of and then that big thing, sigma1 squared over n1 plus sigma2 squared over n2. And so that's what we're taking advantage of here. We're really just doing the same thing that we've been doing. The difference between two means is itself, you know, the sample difference is itself a random variable normally distributed we're just using what we know about the normal distribution that we got from sampling um, to get a z value the problem is once again we don't know what mu1 and mu2 are right if we did well then we would just be doing sampling distribution problems so this is where the hypothesis testing part comes in what we do is we state a null it says mu1 minus mu2 is greater than or equal to some value we're going to call it d0 or that's a, or we have mu1 minus mu2 is less than or equal to d0. Or we might have the null that mu1 minus mu2 is some specific value. There's some specific difference between these three. This side right here, this is the difference under the null. Okay, and that's the basic gist of this. We're going to work with this a little bit more um, and really start to wrap our head around this. I'm going to walk through. Uh, a little bit about what how we go through the steps, but probably the best way to do this is, is show examples. So in the next video, I'm going to try to give an example, and we'll walk through it, and we can look at how we would how we would solve this kind of a problem. Um, there's nothing we're doing that's new, exactly. We're just taking stuff we've already done and applying it. So you just you know we just need to practice you know the formal steps in doing this, and I think we'll be doing just great. Okay, guys, I'll be back in a bit. Bye.